Um, so I'm, my name is Sarah Bernstein. I'm the Executive Director of the Rossing Centre for Education and Dialogue. Uh, delighted to host you this evening. We are a peace-building, inter-religious peace-building organisation uh, uh, located in Israel-Palestine uh, and working to create the desire and capacity for Jews, Christians, Muslims, Israelis and Palestinians to find a way to live together side by side in whatever format uh, we eventually agree, please God. Um, we have we work mainly in the field of uh, education and uh, um, and trying to promote shared society within Israel. Uh, but also working on cross-border issues uh, to do with relations between Israelis and Palestinians as a whole. Um, obviously, these last few months have been challenging, and one of the things uh, we decided to do was to start a series of webinars uh, consulting with experts from around the world uh, um, in order to, to open things up uh, it's obviously a terrible time here. Thousands of people have been killed. Uh, I wish I could say the end is in sight, but there is no end in sight. Uh, and and um, we need to find a way to try and put away, put, put a stop to this cycle of violence and 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 create some new reality. So. This is the next in our series of webinars uh, um, on, on that theme. John, perhaps I can hand over to you and you will introduce Gary. Yes, yeah, so hello everyone. My name is John. I also work at the Rossing Center and I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Reverend Gary Mason. Uh, I've also had the pleasure of, of meeting Gary in person and, and learning a lot from Gary, as he uh, took me and a group of other Israelis and Palestinians around uh, Northern Ireland to learn about the different uh, peace building initiatives uh, and the work that Gary has been involved in for many, many years. I'll just read a quick uh, sort of paragraph about Gary, but honestly, his, his bio is so long because uh, um, he's involved in so many different things. I do encourage you to look at Gary. Uh, Gary's profile at Rethinking Conflict. I'll put the link into the uh, chat, but Gary Mason is a Methodist minister and holds a PhD from the School of Psychology at the University of Ulster. He was also awarded an honorary doctorate in divinity for his role in peace building in Ireland from Florida Southern College. He completed his theological studies at Queen's University and holds a bachelor's in business studies from the University of Ulster. I will put his, um, the link to his bio in the chat, so do feel free to look at what Gary is uh, involved in. Um, but it, to sum it up, Gary basically teaches in many different contexts about peace building. Um, so we will we'll start off the, the, the conversation, uh, just wanting to first get to know Gary and his uh, journey into the peace building field. So it's, uh, it's great to have you with us. Um, Gary, and please uh, go ahead, tell us a bit about how you uh, are involved. How did you get to be involved in the peace building field? Okay, thank you, John. Thank you, Sarah. Good to see both of you again. I mean, I often try to contextualize my life uh, by telling a true story. Uh, three boys uh, born in the 60s, growing up 60s, 70s, just three ordinary kids in Belfast. They could have been born in Jerusalem, Ramallah, New York, Cape Town, Buenos Aires. Two of them went to school together, uh, primary school as we call it in our British Irish context, from the age of uh, four to the age of 11. Uh, another two of those kids uh, went to uh, religious Sunday school together. Uh, one of those boys is now dead. Uh, he was shot, uh, having got involved in political violence, terrorism, paramilitarism, uh, shot in the back in the early 1980s in an internal terrorist suit. Uh, the second boy ended up spending 18 to 20 years in prison uh, for murdering someone, literally slit them ear to ear, 
dump their body in a back alley. I'm the third boy who ends up a Methodist clergy person. And I struggled with that all my life. Uh, these kids, my friends, I played soccer with them. We swam together. We walked to school together. We went to Sunday school together. Uh, I end up a Methodist clergy person involved in peace building. And two of my boyhood friends, one who's long dead. And the other one has struggled with so many difficulties because of the horror of conflict. I was ordained, well, it seems a lifetime ago now, in 1987. Our conflict was still at the height. And maybe just to contextualise that a little bit, John, uh, without giving a kind of long overview of that protracted conflict of ours, Northern Ireland is a tiny, tiny space. In the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, when the conflict was ongoing, tiny population of 1.5 million people. That was it. Over that 30-year period, we had 47,000 injuries, 36,000 shootings, 22,000 armed robberies, 30,000 people went through our penal system, with 16,000 bombings and almost 4,000 deaths. I often extrapolate those figures uh, particularly when I'm in the United States and simply saying if the, the sort of Northern Irish conflict had have happened in the United States over a 30 year period, uh, you would have had 700,000 dead, 6 million political prisoners, 9 million injuries, 7 million shootings and 3 million bombings. So for 30 years of life, my life, I guess, as a, as a colleague of mine, a, a leading academic here said, Basically, it was 30 years of a holiday in hell. All my ministry, John, until I set up Rethinking Conflict, as you know, was uh, in the inner city of Belfast, primarily at Sharp Zones, really from 87 uh, right through to 2014 when I set up this uh, NGO. So that's just a bit of kind of context. So, I mean, I was a child of conflict, a teenager of conflict, and lived through a fair bit of my adult life uh, knowing uh, conflict firsthand. Thank you, Gary. And and so what made you choose this path when so many other kids growing up around you chose different paths? Yeah, yeah. Sarah, you can imagine I've been asked that question 101 times and I kind of often teasingly say, is there such a thing as the theology of luck? I just don't know. I will always condemn terrorism or political violence. Um, and I'm going to do that as a religious leader. I think it's important that religious leaders do that. But I still ask myself the question, because I remember another person who ended up again in political violence said, in the late 1960s, someone did not fly over Northern Ireland or the North of Ireland. And not dissimilar to Israelis and Palestinians, we don't agree in names. Now, those of the nationalist tradition call it the north of Ireland or the six counties. Those who grew up in the British tradition call it Northern Ireland. Was it the War of Independence? Was it the Nakba? We find names the way that you do in your space as well to define certain events. But this person said, you know, someone in the late 1960s did not fly over Northern Ireland, sprays all with some sort of crazy substance, and we all woke up one day and said, right, let's start killing each other. There was a context, a context here, as there's a context in your space. And I would stress strongly that what I would define as a toxic religion and toxic politics was shaping this tiny, tiny space for centuries. And in reality, the three components that were present in our conflict are present also in the Middle East. The issue of land, the issue of identity, and the issue of religion. So to a greater or lesser degree, no matter where you look on planet Earth where conflict is ongoing, to a greater or lesser degree, those three components are there and they were very much within our space. So I've tried to remain while condemning violence, engaging with those who pursued violence on all sides, trying to create, I guess, a moral framework to allow people to make better choices. And I suppose many of the people on our Zoom tonight are people from a religious background. And I've often asked the question, what is the role of religious actors in creating moral frameworks? In other words, preserving life. 
uh, within very, very fractured spaces. Well, definitely we will want to ask you a, a bit more of a, a question on religion and, and theology and your role as a minister. But just before that, I'd be curious to 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 ask you, Gary, um, just as you mentioned the extreme moments of violence that you and your friends uh, were exposed to, how did you, in your work, help shift people's attitudes toward from violence into a more productive um, sort of peace-building vision? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll answer that actually initially by quoting a theologian, uh, particularly people from a Jewish background on here will know very well the late uh, Jonathan Sachs, who had the privilege once of meeting in London. I mean, Jonathan Sachs once said, uh, weapons win wars, but ideas win peace. So I think we need to wrestle with this whole concept of how do we introduce ideas into spaces to actually create alternatives? Because as we all know, when people are involved in conflict, I mean, I've often said um, this quotation that I, that I kind of made up in dealing uh, primarily of men of my gender, it was primarily males. And I often said, if you lock 40 men in a room, listening to their own reassuring voices, it's a recipe for disaster. So how do you create a moral framework or alternative ideas to allow people to begin that long projected journey of moving towards peace? In the early 1990s here, we had what was simply called a mutually hurting stalemate. I mean, what is a mutually hurting stalemate? What does that even look like? Well, it simply meant this, that after 22, 23 years of internal violence within this tiny space in which I live, there wasn't going to be a winner. So very simply put, the British Army, uh, which are one of the most efficient armies in the world, were not going to defeat the IRA. The IRA were never going to defeat the British Army. It was just, it was impossible, absolutely impossible. And the loyalist groupings, the non-state actors, armed actors, on the pro-British side, we're not going to defeat the IRA. So really in the early 90s, I mean, there were a number of factors that arose and I'll kind of deal with those as, as I go through this, but I think there came a realisation that ultimately this was not going to be resolved by violence. And it was at that stage, I suppose, the role of third parties started to come in. I mean, I often... You know, in conversations with colleagues there in the US, who I know are looking at your space through pretty microscopic lenses at the moment. I'm in a, co a conversation with a colleague in DC. Several months ago, I said, you think of Northern Ireland and the amount of outside help we needed. This like tiny little space. We had Canadians involved. We had Americans involved. We had Australians involved. We had Europeans involved. So there was a role for third parties in relation to that. And that was just absolutely crucial. The other concept was trying to get people to humanize each other. It's interesting. I've hosted, as you know, John, you being one of them, I've hosted a thousand Israelis and Palestinians in Belfast over the last 10 to 14 years. And just to say categorically, um, most people assume, well, it must have been all those nice peace-loving liberals. No, no, it wasn't. I've had... As you know, Jewish home here, Likud here, Arab joint list, Maritz, labor, academics, NGOs, wide spectrum of different people. And nearly every Israeli and Palestinian, as you know, John has said to me, Gary, you, you just don't understand our region at all. We don't trust each other. And I kind of say tongue in cheek, do you really think the first time is a very, very young clergy person in the late 1980s, that I went into a room with people with a hell of a lot of blood in their hands? Like, do you really think it was all hugs and kisses? Like we were popping bottles of champagne? We hated each other. We hated each other. And with 101 reasons to know why we hated each other, going back to the 16th, 17th century, or we could even rewind the DVD tonight to the 11th, 12th century. So it was 101 reasons not to go into the room with those people. But to quote again another Jewish theologian of another generation, the great Abraham Josh Herschel, who marched with Martin Luther King Jr., when he rightly said, dehumanization precedes genocide. And so we have this ability on either side of our political and religious tribes 
to dehumanize the other person. So one of the rules, and it's a delicate dance, one of the rules was to try to humanize and understand the other person. And that wasn't easy. And it was not an overnight phenomenon. There was no kind of fast forward to the end of the movie in relation to this. I mean, as, as one colleague of mine once said, getting the IRA to go off the stage was like going into the highest building in the world and turning off the lights one switch at a time. So for us, kind of, particularly those of us who live in the West, uh, who love instantaneous solutions, 12 steps to success, seven steps to a great business, seven steps to spirituality, don't buy those books. Seven steps to peace building, they don't work. This was a long, protracted, difficult process that took almost a decade plus before we even got to the Good Friday Agreement. So I'm not coming on tonight with instantaneous solutions, the very, very protracted difficulties. Um, I have a lot of thoughts, uh, uh, you know, that I'd like to discuss with you. Um, and, and clearly, we understand that we're not going, we're not going to be able to have instantaneous success. I think that, you know, what you say, that sort of those two strands lie very much at the heart of, of what we're trying to do. Um, but so far, it would seem that with every round of, of violence here, um, well, let me, let me speak as, as an Israeli Jew. Israeli Jews seem to think that the reason that this isn't working, or I say that it's a generalization, a certain percentage, a significant percentage of Israeli Jews seem to think that the problem is we're not using enough violence, we're not using enough force. Uh, in other words, they they don't seem to be anywhere near the realization, which I, I remember, you know, shortly after the events of October 7th and as the terrible events in Gaza began to unfold I sort of said to myself you know perhaps now people will finally understand that this cannot work that there is no military solution to this situation that we have to find a way to live together but but we don't seem to be moving in that direction you know today we uh, have some election results from our local elections yeah. We're not, we're not, we're not moving uh, toward. We we don't seem to be moving that way. What how what made people finally understand that we can kill each other forever, or or we can try something else? No, great question, Sarah. There's probably several PhD theses in your question there as well. I mean, one of the things we had to wrestle with, and I say this to all Israelis and Palestinians and other colleagues listening in tonight we had to bring in our extremes. So I would argue strongly, I mean, if people from a liberal tradition here tonight are saying, if everyone was just like me, well, the news is either good or bad, everyone is not going to be like you, ever. That is never, never going to happen. So peace processes are really about compromise. You know, that's primarily it. And I mean, I often say there, there are kind of three types of uh, peace process. Sri Lanka, uh, well, there's no peace negotiations. So, you know, the background is Sri Lanka. Government military forces crush the Tamil Tigers. So you can say, well, yeah, there's peace. There's no one in this call tonight. I don't care if you're on the right, centre or left. You can say to me, Gary, I bet you a thousand dollars there'd be peace there forever. No one can say to me the Tamil Tigers will never rise again. No one can guarantee that. They, they may not. I give you that. But they could rise again. The second one was really South Africa, where what you got there, Sarah, was what I would call colonial regime change at the top, but not a lot of difference at the bottom. So the story of corruption, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in South Africa, we could talk about that all night. Sexual crime against women in townships, record highs. And then you got the Northern Ireland peace process, which is defined academically as a second preference peace process. So what does a second preference peace process mean, Gary? It means you don't get everything you want. 
So people don't like the word compromise. You don't like that word, call it accommodation. I, I do know this, and most of you in this call I haven't met, but I know one thing about all of you. Your lives exist and work relationally. Husbands, partners, wives, children, aunts, uncles, because of compromise. All of us have to compromise in relationships. And so the Good Friday Agreement was a compromise. No one totally got their own way. So, for example, Sinn Féin, political wing of the IRA, they insisted prisoners need to be released immediately. The British wouldn't buy into that. They were released over a two-year period. Uh, the Unionists, so the pro-British, said weapons must be decommissioned before you can go into government. Now, they didn't get that either. The IRA did not uh, decommission their weapons until 2005, the loyalist groupings until June 2009. And it was a process I was involved in. So we all realized that we had to keep our eye on the bigger picture and make some of those compromises along the way. And so it's trying to bring as many people into that tent as possible. There's always going to be spoilers. There's no question about that. Uh, but one of the keys was bringing as many people in. And I guess, you know, Sarah, if I mean, if, if you and I tonight and all our colleagues on the Zoom call were looking back to the 1990s, there were three conflicts grabbing the world's attention. South Africa, Northern Ireland and Israel-Palestine. The wisdom then in the early 1990s was this. People were saying, Oh, it seems um, South Africa's over the line. Apartheid is finally ending. There was an assumption about the Oslo Accords that the Israelis and Palestinians were getting over the line. And most of the world's experts looking at Northern Ireland were going, those cursed Irish. I mean, Winston Churchill, the British bulldog, said the Irish problem is intractable. Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, said the Irish conflict is intractable. My grandmother, as a child, said to me, apart from warning me, growing up in the British Protestant tradition, don't you ever bring a Catholic over this door. And she used to say to me, it'll always be like this, Gary. It will never change. Well, she was wrong. And Margaret Thatcher was wrong. And Winston Churchill was wrong. This place is not utopia. And I think, Sarah and John, you know this, when Israelis and Palestinians are here, they actually like the fact it's not utopia. Because we're still working in our peace process. Most peace processes take 50 years to actually bed down. But my life is completely different. And I know my kids' lives who are in their 20s and 30s. Their life is phenomenally different than the life that I actually had. So those are just some kind of random thoughts around that. Thank you so much. Uh, I do want to pick up on on where you actually started with the extremists and, and we could also say the combatants. And I, and I remember when we were together um, in Belfast that we met some of these um, people who engaged in, in, in combat um, from, from the two uh, sides, so to speak. And uh, I think the case here is that we also have a lot of people who are either combatants or interested in engaging in, in one sort of violence or another. Can you speak to us a bit more about how you would um, approach uh, uh, militant groups? Um, what type of perhaps also backlash would you receive from yeah. from your own community? Um, uh, I think that the, the, those types of insights could be very valuable to, to our context here. I mean, John, going back just to what I was highlighting with Sarah, those kind of three peace processes, there's also three ways of dealing with conflict. Uh, the first one is elimination or annihilation, which is pretty difficult, by and large. But the second one's containment. So, I mean, categorically, if you're asking me, could the British army have contained the IRA forever? The answer is yes. Uh, we had here, sadly, the awful phrase we had here in the early 1990s. There weren't as many dying. But the phrase was, there was an acceptable level of violence. So there weren't hundreds and hundreds and hundreds dying the way there were in the 70s and into the 80s. But I think most people realise that it can't go on. So containment is another way. And the next one really is then through negotiation. Now, to allow those pursuing political violence or terrorism a kind of free-for-all in negotiation is fundamentally wrong. 
So there has to be restrictions, rules of engagement. So for the political wing of the IRA, namely Sinn Féin, to move into the political process, which they eventually did, there had to be a map set out that they were going to renounce violence. And eventually that meant weapons decommissioning. Now, there was always back channels. There were always, I mean, the, the kind of technical phrases we all know was kind of interlocutors or, as I kind of defined them, temperature readings. So there are people who are always taking temperatures of these uh, terrorist organizations. Were they genuine about wanting to move towards peace? Because people can exploit you. There's no question about that. People can lie to you with a smile on their face. There's no question about that either. So it does take a lot of wisdom to navigate what are very, very difficult waters. So, I mean, very simply put, accepting terrorist demands under the threat of violence is appeasement. But talking to people is not the same as agreeing with them. So the phrase I've often used is engagement is not endorsement. Because I disagree and I fundamentally disagree with what people did here killing numerous innocent civilians. I wasn't rubber stamping their ideology or sometimes their warped theology. But people only in change in the context of human relationships. And it can also be very counterproductive as well. I mean, if you handle those negotiations badly, you end up legitimizing the armed group or it can provide incentives or you convince terrorists the offer of talks is convincing us we are winning. But as one writer has actually said, those are questions of timing and tactical handling rather than arguments against speaking to people. And I suppose one of the key concepts there, John, has been, again, that mutually hurting stalemate, both sides believing they can't win militarily. So by the early 1990s, senior British military experts and analysts were saying, look, this is really difficult to win. So if either side thinks it can win, it's not going to negotiate seriously. Primarily what it will do, it'll take what I call like tactical advantage from the negotiation. But fortunately in our space, the stars did align. And people did move into a space that allowed us to begin to move forward. And that was also, I think maybe just a highlight as well, that one of the key things here, and I know we're gonna come on to this, the whole rule of kind of civic society, but as an outsider looking in to the Israeli-Palestinian theater, and I'm not an expert, I mean, I'm a person who's deeply concerned about the region, as many other people globally are. But I think sometimes what has been happening there is a kind of a flawed methodology in pursuing a peace process. That the kind of conflict is a kind of it's a it's a technical problem, which the way is the way Oslo really dealt with the thing. We, we we will deal with this with a selective and exclusive leadership. I think when you do that, that strategy actually fails to address a very complex entanglement of grievance, belief, ideology, which characterizes the region's context. So what does a, an inclusive peace process look like? For senior mid-level political leaders, community leaders, religious leaders, all of a road to play in pursuing that goal towards peace. So we have a theory here developed by a close colleague of mine, brilliant sociologist called the uh, political peace process versus the social peace process. And I think, I mean, having traveled in and out of the Israeli-Palestinian theater, I do see, and this is a source of encouragement, even in the midst of all the massive pain and agony that you're suffering at the moment, there are more and more NGOs like yourselves who are wrestling with these issues. And I, I think that in the midst of all this is something that, that is positive and is important. I remember kind of probably, I'm thinking probably Sarah and John probably, 2017, 2018, doing a, a meeting somewhere in Tel Aviv, Rothschild Avenue, and a group of Israelis and Palestinians were in the room. And it was almost, uh, I was nearly describing peace building. It was like the Russian rocket Sputnik with all these antennas pointing in 101 different directions. I think as I look at your space now, as someone who's been in the voluntary sector, the third sector, as we call it here, there does seem to be a more joined up approach to peace building. And I think that is positive. 
Um, and I think that is one of the lessons from the Irish peace process. Uh, they're not identical, you know. So I've spoken in Israel and I've said to people, look, I am not, you know, politicians say, well, the Good Friday Agreement is the blueprint for the Middle East. Nonsense. Anyone says that to you, that comes with a government health warning, like a packet of cigarettes. There are lessons from here that may have applicability in your space. Things we got right and a hell of a lot of things we got wrong that may have applicability within your space. And I think if people are coming with that tone, I think it's worthwhile having that conversation. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, the lot for us uh, learned, but also to learn consciously, as, as, uh, as you reminded. Um, I'd like to also, uh, we're an interreligious organization. We engage with uh, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Druze, uh, secular atheists, and all the variety and diversity within each tradition, which, as you know, is, is quite diverse. I know the context in, in, in Belfast is very different in terms of, of sort of interreligious uh, uh, makeup of, of Belfast, but can, can you speak a bit more to, to, to your role as a minister, the role of, of religious leaders, the role of theology, um, how how were actors in those sectors and the religious, if I can call it the religious sector, contributed to um, to more of a positive change? Yeah. I think one of the first things you have often highlighted, and I say this as a religious actor, not dissimilar to many folk on this, I think religious people need to be realistic. So I'm, I'm not, I just put my cards on the table, I'm not under this kind of kumbaya. There were some of my colleagues, bless them, worked in the assumption if we could just get Catholics and Protestants worshipping in the same church together, all will be well. That was nonsense. Absolute nonsense. I mean, the word reconciliation, I mean, a theologian once said reconciliation is no cheap matter. It does not come about by simply papering over deep-seated differences. Reconciliation presupposes confrontation. Now, I think I would say manage confrontation. Because without that, you don't get reconciliation, but really a temporary glossing over of differences. So in other words, the running sores of society cannot be healed with the use of a sticking plaster. So reconciliation presupposes an operation, like cutting to the very bone without anesthesia, because the infection is not just on the surface. The abscess of hate and mistrust between Israeli, Palestinian, British, Protestant, Irish, Catholic, is not just on the surface. And you literally have to slash it open. So you have to create spaces where people are hearing the other person's story. And I mean, science does prove that looking at this whole concept, that creating those listening circles or those spaces are really absolutely crucial. I mean, one of your own uh, Israeli diplomats, uh, Ben Ami, said collective psychology, uh, national myths, and the perception that a given group have of its enemy have always been major factors in the decision in going to war. So some of those conversations between the opposing tribes in your space and my space do have to been, be about dealing with those deep-seated collective psychologies, centering them this, which try to build lasting relationships that can lead to long-term reconciliation. But it's not sitting around a campfire holding hands that someone could someone pray a Jewish prayer, perhaps someone play an Islamic prayer. Would someone pray a Christian prayer? I'm not knocking that, so I'm not being cynical. But the infection is not just on the surface. We need to drill down into what has actually divided us in the first place. Because we all use interpretive keys. Jews, Muslims, Christians, Irish Catholics, British Protestants. The way we remember so. I've often asked the question, what does a deep remembering look like? Because we all know the stories that we tell each other, how they shape our spiritual health, our mental health. They shape our internal or external psychology and the way we behave and the way we think. And so how do we create in our space? And we're still doing this 26 years in a matter of weeks time in April with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. We're still doing listening circles and once upon a time moments. 
because we're still getting to know each other, having lived segregated lives for such a long time. So there's no instantaneous fix for this. I mean, this is a long haul process. But I do argue strongly that religious actors do need to be at the table. I just think that is so, so crucial. And it has, I think, been one of the kind of success stories really of that Irish peace process. So, I mean, it's what I kind of call a sort of the multidisciplinary approach to peace building. And we need politicians in the room, but we just don't need politicians. We need historians, we need theologians, we need psychologists, we need philosophers. Um, because politicians work in the assumption, even in our space, interestingly, I mean, politicians work in the assumption that once the deal is done, societal healing automatically follows. I mean, nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. And we all know any person, I mean, I'm not getting a politicians because I have many friends who are politicians. I could do a massive critique on religion only we have time for that. But research shows that formal peace processes have a higher chance of success and sustainability when they include religious actors, women, youth, and often other overlooked groups in negotiations. So in other words, every person needs to be at the table. And that is, to my mind, is one of the kind of success stories of the Irish peace process. That Because, I mean, our government has been like a circus, as you guys know, over the last 25 years. I mean, we've a devolved assembly in Belfast. In the last 25 years, the darn thing has been down 40% of the time because the politicians can't agree. So people often say to me, hey, Gary, why have you guys not gone back to war? And I say this, to my mind, civic society is the social glue that holds our peace process together. Like the Rossing Centre, Amal Tikva, another group I work with, uh, NSI, uh, Talking Peace, all those different groups. You're the social glue that holds those spaces together. And that's why they're so important. And more and more research is defining that in immense academic detail over the last number of years. I'd like to ask um, something which I think is very, uh, um, you know, we're struggling with at the moment, which is that it's increasingly difficult to get Israelis and Palestinians into the same room um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but also there is, um, uh, and there is a growing feeling certainly on the Palestinian side that, um, that they would rather not, they don't want to do dialogue, they would rather do uninational work and that we should work separately so we need to work with jews separately and with and and with palestinians separately did you have that that sort of those sorts of you know did you find that uninational work was effective in changing people's attitudes is is do you, what do you feel about that that whole dilemma so in those early days, I guess, moving up towards ceasefires in 94, there was a lot of what we simply call single identity work. Realizing that the kind of two tribes needed preparatory work before engaging with the other tribe. Um, so there was that. I mean, as we spilled towards the ceasefires in 1994, I designed this program and you know, there's no copyright on it, take it. It was called Journey and Understanding, uh, where for five Five or six weeks, sort of British Protestants, Irish Catholics did stuff on their own. First of all, to prepare people for encountering the other in a very, very intimate, detailed way. And then they came together for five or six weeks. Now, we were able to do that in the early 90s, mid 80s. No, it was more single identity, trying to explore possibilities, quiet meetings with the other, but they could never be publicized as well. So there was a process. So, I mean, if you're on tonight and you're feeling, there's no way I could do this with the other at the moment, well, well, don't do it. Begin an internal conversation with your own grouping and ask them, how do they see the way forward? So don't be hung up the feet, oh, I need to rush out and you know embrace my enemy tonight. You don't need to do that. But you need to prepare yourself. And listen, it could be five, 10 years. I mean, 
even if you move into a peace process, and I know there's a lot of alleged experts from TikTok to Facebook, whatever, um, who have all the solutions, no one is going to put on your website tomorrow, Sarah and John, here is the solution to the Middle East. Most of us have some idea. Is it one state? Is it two state? Is it a confederation? Federation? Is it two states, one homeland? Most of us have some idea of what the possibilities may be. The key is, I mean, when Israelis and Palestinians are with me, and John, you know this, and I often say to them, look, tell me, what have you learned since you've been here? Not what I have said you need to learn. What have you learned? They say five things. They say one of the lessons from the Irish peace process as a Palestinian or Israeli is political leadership is essential to achieving peace. So they simply say, you know, Gary, leaders on all sides must sincerely believe that change is preferable to the status quo and then be willing to take the risk to achieve peace. But you've got to provide a vision to do that to maintain the confidence of your grassroots supporters. The second thing they say is really what I've alluded to there, that there was a desire in both our communities to break the cycle of violence to save future generations from endless conflict. And because of that desire for a better future, it encouraged leaders to take risks, face down accusations of betrayal from within their own communities to achieve peace. The third one I've alluded to, the whole concept of trust. But the other thing that comes about there as well is that attempts to resolve the conflict through military force were actually ultimately futile. I mean, I knew as a kid in the 70s, once I'd finished my homework and my parents had packed me off to bed, if I heard the nine o'clock news and I heard on it, two Catholics were murdered tonight. I knew by the time I got up the next morning, two Protestants were murdered. So I knew that. I mean, I didn't need to be told. So it was simply, you hurt us, we'll hurt you. So then the question naturally has to be asked, how did you get real security? Security was only achieved when dialogue was prioritised. The root causes of the conflict were addressed by the establishment of new frameworks, new institutions that gave space for each community to pursue peacefully their vision for a new Northern Ireland or a new North of Ireland. And the fifth lesson I've already alluded to, that actual role of civic society. Academics, business people, women's groups, religious leaders who weren't prepared to let the politicians' fingerprints just be on that. Not knocking politicians. But, I mean, you can't have 100 people shaping society forever. Civic society needs to be at the table. And I just think from my perspective, that's really, really crucial. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, I do want to be cautious of your time because I know that you're going on to, to teach uh, a group uh, in the U.S. or facilitate uh, um, a conversation in the U.S. context. But I, I, I do want to leave the next 15 minutes also for some questions from, from the audience. Uh, so this is also a, a hint to the audience that if you do have a question, please write it in the chat. And now there's two proper question, questions one, I think you already answered, uh, but I'll let you decide if you want to uh, have another go. But it's uh, it's the question is, how do we uh, contain the extremists? Um, we have done a lot of what uh, you have said. This is sort of a one, one question. Um, and the second one from a good friend of the Russian Center, Dr. Uh, Almut, uh, how do you, Gary, deal with the experience of victimizing the other, start a healing process for reconciliation? So I'll start off with those two questions. And if other audience members have questions, please feel free to write them in the chat. Yeah. Okay, let me just touch on that extremism one again. And in answering this and in saying this, and again, I'm putting this health warning, I am never, never condoning terrorism or political violence. 30,000 people, many of them of my generation, some older, some younger, went through our penal system. Uh, they're all now released from prison. Many are dead. But of those 30,000, this is our context, only 3% have reoffended. 3% out of 30,000, which is minimalistic. 
So the question you had to ask yourself, those 30,000 people had been born in Paris, Berlin, Stockholm, San Diego, would they have been involved in criminality, whatever you want to call it? And the answer is no. Are you asking me were a number of them natural born killers and psychopaths? The answer is yes. They enjoyed killing. But for a significant number of them, as I said earlier, there was something wrong with this society. It was not a normal space. Because no, this doesn't happen in Scotland. It's not happening in Canada. So there's something with this space that was not normal. It was abnormal that turned these people into killers. And they were wrong in killing. I mean, I categorically say that, so I'm not going to kind of rubber stamp that by any means. You're not going to bring everyone with you. But looking at how the IRA and Sinn Féin moved off the stage away from political violence, it was a lesson. But they needed outside help. You know, so, I mean, Adams, Jerry Adams, who's a well-enough known figure, Martin McGuinness, who's deceased, former chief of staff of the IRA. It was people like that who were people who knew the whole realms of political violence that led their constituents in the right direction. I mean, Ian Paisley, who was a right-wing religious fundamentalist, eventually went in to government with his sworn enemies. But this was a long, protracted process. Um, so you're not going to bring everyone with you. So don't assume that I'm going to like sprinkle some sawdust here in this screen and there's, there's a simple recipe. Some people you just simply have to face down. And try to bring as many people with you as possible. And that was a reasonable success story of our peace process. Uh, both politicians, clergy and others were able to do that. Let me talk about this kind of healing process and, I mean, how we do that. Because, I mean, we're still, you know, we're still, even today, there's a court case here in Belfast today about legacy. We still, 25 years, 26 years after the Good Friday Agreement to the person that asked that, we still have not got the architecture to deal with the past. The number of attempts, number of assistance from folk in the US, but we still haven't got that. So we're still wrestling with that. I chair this item why dialogue group called Compass Points, about 80, 90 people from many different walks of life. And I often open it uh, with this quotation. It's from Brett Stevens, New York Times journalist. And he said, in order to Disagree well, you must first understand well. Not agree. In order to disagree well, you must first understand well. So how do we create a context where I begin, painful as that may be, to understand the other? And in doing that, painfully, I think, you can begin to humanize the other. I mean, Brand Stevens, the uh, Just Mercy movie that some of you have seen, also heads up the lynching museum there in Montgomery, Alabama. Brand Stevenson puts it like this. When we get close, we hear things that can't be heard from afar. We see things that can't be seen. And sometimes that makes the difference between acting justly and unjustly. So how do we create spaces in our context to humanize the other person? And I mean, I can assure you, and I've said this to Israeli Palestinians 101 times, Sarah and John, as you know, the hatred in our place was phenomenal. And I've also seen hatred in the Middle East as well. I've seen hatred in South Africa. I've seen hatred in the United States. So this wasn't kind of, you know, people often say to me, <laughs> but Gary, sure you were all uh, mostly white and uh, you were all Christian. Listen, read the history of Christianity. It's not pretty. You know, 100 years religious war, which is really 104 years. Christians know how to kill. We know that only too well. So, to, so I mean, the hatred was deep going back centuries. Um, and I think we also have to have the ability to critique religion. Because uh, many times religious actors don't want to do that for fear of upsetting the institution. Um, so... How do we allow those critiques to happen? And I think it's only in creating spaces where people can humanize and hear each other in a legitimate way.
Um, we just had a uh, another question from the audience come in. Um, it, it it starts uh, as follows. Do you think that there comes a point at which one party forfeits the chance to influence terms of resolution? You talked about two Catholics for two Protestants, but this current situation, let alone previous decades, stands at a thousand Israelis for three thousand Palestinians. In a situation of such drastic imbalance, to achieve a balanced resolution, we can't approach both sides equally, can we? Question mark. Okay. I'm actually going to try to pull that up in in the chat so that I get the the gist of it there exactly. So give me All just right. a second to, to do that so that I kind of read it. Good. Uh, you can tell me whereabouts it is in the chat because is it the uh, <laughs> yeah I got it. Yeah, it's Matthew Teller, whom I know. Yep. Okay. So Matthew saying, Gary, do you think there comes a point when one party forfeits the chance? To influence terms of resolution, two Catholics, two Protestant, thousand Israelis, thirty thousand Palestinians. In the situation is such that we're to achieve it, we can't approach both sides equally, can we? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Matthew, that's very, very complex in relation to that, and um, I know we can get into head counts around this because I mean, I'll give you, I'll give you my head count in relation to this. Um, the IRA killed 60%, 60% of casualties in MySpace. Vast majority of innocent civilians. Loyalist groupings, Loyalist paramilitary groupings killed 30%. State forces killed 10%. So have I negotiated with the IRA? The answer is yes. Uh, was that painful and difficult? Again, the answer is yes. But I have kind of categorized it, the phrase I've often used, that you need to take what I call, and I do put some of this in the religious framework, what I call thoughtful strategic risks for peace. So I was not rubber stamping what they were doing because I know as many Israelis and Palestinians do. All of us know people have been killed because Israel, Palestine's a tiny space. It's bigger than this space, but it's a tiny space. So I had to sit in rooms with people whose history was not pretty. But I had to ask myself the question, for the greater good, where do I go with this? And I could have continued to verbally assassinate them for what they did. Or could we try to see a bigger picture and begin to move a critical mass forward for the sake of the next generation. And I mean, those were difficult days. I mean, there's no question, you know, I, I look back and, you know, I look back to what happened on 7th October and subsequent events. And I look back to our space here in actually in October, 1993 and November, 1993, when there were a lot of conversations going on behind the scenes of which I was aware. And then we had the Shankill bombing with Grey Steel. And we thought after all the work we'd done, we're going over the edge. I lost two friends in a bombing, 23rd of October, 1993. Still remember, remember the day. I still, when I'm lecturing in this, I often say, I still remember the colour of the suit add-on that day, the clerical collar add-on today, that day. I don't know what shirt add-on yesterday. You know, so we've all been scarred by these events. There's no question about it. Um, but for me, if there wasn't talking, what was the alternative? And the Gwindia framework, I guess, as well, where it's constant criticism of the other person, particularly publicly. I mean, we had some heated debates. And I think the other question, I've just highlight Matthew and others in relation to this is, when do you make the private public? I think John and Sarah, that needs a lot of wisdom. So we had quiet conversations, quiet negotiations, for years. And it's only when we felt the temperature was right. So we had to put some of these things into the public space in the late 1980s. It may have collapsed. But as we moved towards ceasefires, um, the phrase we used was we needed confidence building measures so that people on both sides actually believed that there may be a way forward. And I suppose I'll tell a story. This maybe begins to sound a bit like a sermon, but I think it's worth saying. Three years ago, 
it may have been during the group we were on, I can't even remember, but in the early days, there was a group of Israelis, Palestinians, I'm guessing mostly 20s, 30s, 40s. And a young Palestinian woman came up to me on the first night and uh, quite candid, quite blunt, she said to me, Gary, I think this is a waste of time. And I said, you know what? You may well be right. The next five days may be a complete waste of time, no relevance to the Middle East. And I give you that, you could be right. But I said, see the last night before you fly back to the Middle East, I just want you to say three words to me. He says, oh, really? He says, yeah, just three words. He says, well, what are those words then? And I said, maybe, just maybe. Because you think you're coming here and I'm going to give you a blueprint for the Middle East. Well, that ain't going to happen. But I just want you the last evening, if possible, to say those three words. That maybe, just maybe, having seen one of the most protracted, intractable conflicts on planet Earth being resolved, but not perfect, that maybe, just maybe, it may give you the oxygen of hope as a young Palestinian woman to be able to go back to that region and just say that. Don't go back and say, well, I've got it after five days in Belfast, because you won't. And you know where the story's going. And the last night, she came up to me with tears in her eyes, put her arms around me, says, Gary, maybe, just maybe. So that's all I would say, particularly those Israelis, Palestinians who are on this tonight, and others spoke from the States, Germany, UK, etc. But just try to hold that. And don't, even in the midst of absolute despair, because if we lose hope, I mean, for all of us, look, if I get cancer this week, I hope I get better. If I fail my exams, I hope I get the resets. If I lose my job, I hope I get another. So I said to colleagues in the ground there, painful and difficult as it is, when everything does look hopeless, try to still breathe out oxygen of hope in the very protracted, difficult spaces. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh I was actually going to end with a question about resilience and hope. So I think that uh, <laughs> uh, ended very well. Um, on behalf of uh, myself, the Rotten Center, and I think all the audience uh, in this uh, webinar and those who will watch the recording later on, uh, we want to thank you for your time, for your experience, knowledge, wisdom, and we wish you all the best in your, <laughs> your important work um, in wherever you're consulting and also in the context of Belfast. So thank you so much. Okay, look, best wishes and prayers with you, all of you, that uh, maybe just maybe this time next year, our conversation may be really, really different. So look, bless you all and good night. Okay, bye.